So, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do now is to give you a potted history of the world in the early 21st century, followed by some reflections on the mid and late 21st century. So, I mean, we might as well get started. We have a lot of ground to cover. The contemporary world is, what is it? Too full, too hot, too intense, too fast, too polluted, too neoliberal, too polarized, too strongly dominated by human beings. All of the above and more. We now live in an era which some scientists have called the Anthropocene, that is to say the era of humanity, the, the geological and historical period where humanity's footprint is felt everywhere in the world. From the skyscrapers of Manhattan to the deserts of Mongolia, from the Antarctic to the Amazon jungle, you can feel the footprint of humanity. There's no escape. We're everywhere. Um, and also, we live in a period of acceleration, of acceleration, of acceleration. I mean, modernity, modern civilization has always been associated with change and with speed. Since the early 19th century, people have been worried about speed and have been enthusiastic about it. And one of the things that characterizes a modern mentality is a positive attitude to change as a source of progress and development and the betterment of humanity. What has happened in the last, say, 20, 25 years is that this process of change, development, etc., has, as it were, shifted to a higher gear. We, we now live through the acceleration of acceleration. I don't know if you've noticed it, but changes are taking place faster and faster and faster. And I'm not just thinking about the replacement of old mobile phones with new ones, OK? And how old models go obsolete after a few months so that you have to go out and shop and buy a new, a new mobile. I'm also thinking about lots of other things. And I'll give you some examples in a little while if you don't believe me. So what I'm saying is that change has been fast for 200 years and it has now accelerated. So we are, as it were, in a period where we've shifted to a higher gear. We shifted to a higher gear in the contemporary global modernity and we're driving on a highway with no speed limit and with no direction, it seems, which is a bit scary. I'm calling these processes of acceleration overheating. It's not just about climate change. It's part of the puzzle, but it's not the entire picture. Overheating can be illustrated in a few ways. In physics, heat and speed are two sides of the same coin. So speed generates heat. If you drive your car in the wrong way on a highway and too fast, it will overheat. So it will stop, basically, and it will spew out copious amounts of black smoke and it will die, right? So had, but had you chosen a different style of, uh, of driving or had you had a proper cooling system in place, it would not have happened. Just as when people experience burnouts, you know, burnouts are also about speed, speed which generates too much heat, too much internal heat. So in the end, you can't stand it anymore. Another way of talking about overheating is, is very familiar to those of you who are Norwegian, because this is a cold country. And in winter, when we go outside without our gloves, our hands get cold. And what do we do then? We rub them together. It generates friction and it generates heat. It warms them up. And if I could rub my hands together really, really fast, they would eventually burn up. But I don't do that, you see, because we human beings have an inbuilt thermostat which tells us when to stop, which says that this is fine, this is enough. Don't rub your hands together fast than that because then they're going to burn out. And what is slightly scary and sinister about the overheating situation in the world today with accelerated change is that there is no such thermostat. There is no instance which can tell us that this is fine, this is enough. Let's take a break, let's cool down, let's slow down a bit and see what happens then. Uh, so the overheating continues. Now it's time to give you some examples. Well, let's, let's begin uh, with something uh, with which everybody is familiar, population growth. You're, you're familiar with this population growth curve, which looks like this, right? Uh, starting uh, typically around the year 1800, where we were one billion altogether. Um, so it took us a couple of hundred thousand years as humanity to reach the first billion. It then took us just another hundred years to reach the second billion. 
And then after that, it took us another 100 years to reach 7.5 billion and counting. So that's a steep curve. But there are other curves which are steeper. Uh, one of them is, and it's far more recent, the spread of the internet. Now it goes without saying that it's been steep because in, in 1990, uh, hardly anybody was online. But the acceleration of acceleration continues in the world of the internet as well. So uh, as late as 2006, it was estimated that between 2 and 3% of all Africans, uh, sub-Saharan Africans, without South Africa, which has a different history, had access to the internet. Between 2 and 3%. At the latest count, and that would not have been last week, but last year, so it's probably changed since then. Remember, things happen fast these days, okay? But last year, it was estimated at somewhere between 25 and 30%. Now, the answer is simple. The coming of the inexpensive smartphone. But the consequences can be enormous in a continent like Africa. So the, so the development continues. And since I mentioned the smartphone, an even more spectacular change which has taken place in an even shorter period of time is the number of photographs taken in the world. Okay? We've seen a trebling of the number of photographs taken in the world between 2010 and 2015. In five years, we went from 1.35 trillion to 1 trillion photos taken in the world. Now, the ex explanation is simple. Most photos are now taken with gadgets like this. 80% of all photos are now taken with mobile phones. Okay? Um, but the implications have not been understood. What does this do to our ability to understand pictures when they're free, they're ephemeral, they're, they're fleeting, and they're all over the place? And we take them continuously with or without selfie sticks. Now, some other changes that I might uh, uh, want to talk about. Let's, uh, yeah, there are so many things we could have talked about. Let's talk about tourism. As early as the late 1970s, people in Spain were complaining that there was too much tourism. And, and especially people from Northern Europe were complaining that the Spanish coast was being ruined by, by tourism. It was no longer authentically Spanish. Because you could get English meat pies and you could watch Liverpool football games and you could buy your Scandinavian newspapers in the shops there. No longer authentically Spanish. They'd only seen in the beginning. In 1979, Spain received a total of 15 million tourist arrivals. Um, by, uh, by 2015, the number was fourfold increased to 60 million. 60 million. So if you wonder why people in Barcelona and in uh, Mallorca are now demonstrating against tourism, because there's too much of a good thing. It brings income, yes, but it squeezes out the local population. Now you know, a fourfold increase in one generation. Or we could talk about migration. When I started to get engaged with and write about migration and minority issues in Norway, there were about 200,000 immigrants plus descendants, first-generation descendants in this country. 200,000 in 1990. At the latest count last year, there was about 850,000. That's more than a four-fold increase in less than 30 years. Or we could talk about international trade. Did you know that the ports of Shanghai and Singapore have doubled their, uh, uh, their turnover uh, in, the, in the slightly over 10 years, between 2003 and 2014? And that world trade has grown by 600% since uh, 1980, while world GDP has only grown by 250%. So there's something, there's something uncannily uh, convergent about all these tendencies of growth. Now, some forms of growth, some forms of accelerated change are more important than others. I've already mentioned population. Probably, had there only been one billion of us, like there was at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, we could have done pretty much as we liked. But we can't do that anymore. We have to be considerate to each other. We have to follow traffic rules. We have to look in the rear mirror to look for other traffic on the road because we're no longer alone on the highway. But even more spectacular than population growth is the growth in energy use. Now, population has grown by a factor of seven, whereas energy use has grown by a factor of 30, mainly through fossil fuels. Now, that is one of the big problems facing us, isn't it? Uh, the fact that the fossil fuels, which have been the salvation of humanity, the source of global civilization, the only reason that we can be here in this warm, nice, cozy, high-tech room, it started with the coal. 
It's a fossil fuel generated civilization. So what was the salvation of humanity for 200 years is now slowly becoming our damnation. Through the depletion of non-renewable resources, through pollution and through long-term climate change. And it's hard to get your head around that. What was our salvation is becoming our damnation. We need to find a way out of this overheating conundrum, this overheating dilemma. Now, how do people in local communities react to these accelerated changes? When a mining operation starts nearby, when a new highway is being built, when new factories, shopping malls, you name it, are being created all around you, and you've been driven off the land and into the cities, as they are in many parts of the world where urbanization is taking place at a frightful speed. So that's going to be another example, uh, namely that uh, the urban growth in the global south is also phenomenal. It's so huge that it's almost impossible to understand. 90% of the population growth in a country like Kenya takes place in the slums of Nairobi and Mombasa. And people don't go there for fun, but because they're being driven off the land or because the countryside feels crowded. So how do people react? They react in lots of different ways to accelerated change, to fast changes. But many react through resentment against the elites, against the powers that be, against those dim forces in the distance that influence our lives without asking us for our opinion. Nobody asked me for my opinion. So who can I blame and what can I do? is a typical response to these accelerated changes when they come from the outside. Nobody asked me for my opinion. So what do you do then? Well, uh, to make a long history short, uh, contemporary politics is very much about competition between neoliberalism with no heart and identity politics with no brain. And interestingly, in the White House, we now have a person who represents both. <laughs> no heart, no brain. It's, and he's elected which says something about the state of the world today, and it's not alone. We're getting similar leaders in Eastern Europe. We have religious fanaticism, which is uh, creating a lot of trouble in the Middle East and elsewhere, uh, and we have other forms of withdrawal into identity politics based on the suspicion of others and the wish to build walls. As you realize, I don't think this is a good solution. Now the diagnosis may be okay, it may be good, yes, we need to regain control of our lives. Yes, people are taking uh, uh, command of our lives without asking us for our opinion. But if we need other options, we need other alternatives. Remember that there's seven and a half billion of us. We're all in this together and we all need a chance. So my solution is briefly to cool down, slow down and scale down. Cool down, slow down and scale down. It's going to create a world which is less affluent, less prolific, less consumerist, but also more diverse, more decentralized, where happiness is more important than consumption, where responsibility is more important than hedonism, and where we can try to find a way of living together. So scale down, slow down, and cool down, but look up, because there's seven and a half billion of us, and we must never lose one of the greatest achievements of modern civilization, namely the ability to identify with people far away and to see the whole human family as one big uh, group. On that note, I thank you for your attention and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.